G'day everyone. Today we're gonna to have a look at differentials. We'll talk about what they are, what they do, and we'll have a look at all the parts that make up a differential and see how they work together to make our cars move along the road. We'll also talk about a few different applications of the differentials and a few different gear sets as well. Now, it doesn't matter what type of car you drive, whether it is a four wheel drive, all wheel drive, front wheel drive, or rear wheel drive, it will have a differential of some sort. It's important to have a differential in order to handle the road and turn corners. This particular one is out of a rear wheel drive, four wheel drive vehicle. It is an LSD differential and it has a high point gear set. So what does a differential do? Well, on a rear wheel drive vehicle like this one, it performs three basic functions. It gives us a final drive ratio. After the transmission, we get another gear reduction. So we have a torque increase and a speed decrease at the wheels, usually around four to one. It also allows us to split the power in two directions to a left and right wheel. We have the power coming straight down the middle of the vehicle and it is turned 90 degrees either direction via the bevel gear here. It also allows us to have a differential in speed between the two wheels. That is its name and it's its most important purpose. We need to have the left and the right wheel able to turn at different speeds while we're driving the vehicle. So why is it so important for us to have two different wheels traveling at different speeds on, in this example, a rear wheel drive vehicle? Well, if we're turning a corner, the inside wheel will always travel less distance than the outside wheel. The outside wheel therefore needs to speed up and the inside wheel needs to slow down. If we didn't have a differential, we would scrub our tires and probably drift the vehicle, which is all jolly cool, but it's not a very civilized way to drive a vehicle on the road day to day. So the differential will allow the inside wheel to slow down and the outside wheel to speed up. And the outside wheel will speed up an equivalent amount to how much the inside wheel has slowed down. So if we grab the inside wheel and make it stationary, the outside wheel will turn at double the normal speed. One wheel must always be turning with a differential. We can't hold both of them. That will stop the propeller shaft and stall the vehicle. So we guarantee that one wheel always gets some amount of rotational force and it is equivalent between the two and the differential will decide which one gets all of this rotational force or the torque depending on the load on the other wheel, assuming we have an open center differential. So in order to achieve all these things, we have a few components that make up the differential. Now, it doesn't matter how big a differential is, whether it's on a heavy earth moving machinery or it's in something small like this, the components are all the same. So in this case, we have a pinion. Now this pinion is driven by the propeller shaft and this will drive the bevel gear in this case. The bevel gear is the gear that changes the direction of drive through 90 degrees and this will also turn the axles. Now it turns the axles through this housing. We have a housing here, we have the plane side of the housing and we have the flange side of the housing. The flange side has a flange in it, the plane side is plane. We have two carrier bearings. Now they carry the diff center in the housing and inside we have two axle gears. Now they spline to the axles to offer drive and we have two pinion or spider gears. Now their design is if we see resistance to one of the axle gears, that axle gear will start to slow down. As a result, these pinion or spider gears will walk around that axle gear and offer the torque to the wheel that has less resistance to the other axle gear. That axle gear will speed up and the one with the resistance will slow down. It may come to a stop, it may slow down, and the equivalent amount of speed or torque will be offered to the other wheel. Now that makes up the whole assembly. It's inside a carrier housing. We have two caps here that hold it down. Now on the heavy earth moving equipment, these caps will actually have a thrust pin on one side, on the bevel gear side. The reason for that is when we offer a lot of torque into a differential like this, they will try and splay the caps out sideways and we lose preload on our gears. As the gears are pushing against each other, the pinion and the bevel gear, it will push the bevel gear away and flex on these caps. Now it doesn't matter how big these caps are, they do flex, so we run a thrust pin that we shim into the axle housing to hold it steady and make sure that bevel gear stays exactly where it needs to stay. Now there are a few different types of pinions and bevel gears. This particular one is called a hypoid gear set. We can see the spiral on the pinion is very aggressive. It is quite 
uh, a curve and it has a large amount of tooth contact. The tooth, if we were to straighten it out, would be very, very large. And it doesn't sit in the center of the bevel gear. If we try and put it in the center, it doesn't quite fit. The center line of the pinion actually goes through on the lower half of this bevel gear. We can also see in the axle housing here, the pinion is offset and it is very, very low. Now this hypoid gear set offers a very strong and reliable tooth contact. The more tooth contact we have, the stronger this is gonna be. It can handle more torque and do the job more effectively. And this is used in this particular four drive, a hypoid gear set. Now having an open center differential is all well and good. It's very comfortable on the road and we can turn corners easily without any resistance. And that's great until we go off road. As soon as we go off road, if we have a wheel off the ground with an open center differential, that wheel is gonna receive all of the torque. This little RC car here has an open center differential. We can see that by turning one wheel, the other wheel will turn backwards very easily and the propeller shaft is not turning. Now that suggests a very open center differential because the bevel gear isn't turning, there's no resistance, that is totally open center. Doesn't work off road, the wheel with traction will not receive any of the torque and that's what we need. So that's where an LSD comes in. This is an LSD out of a four wheel drive. Most will have an LSD in the back, meaning a limited slip differential. It gives us some slip, but it's limited. So we can, we can drive on the road, we can turn corners, but if we put our foot down and we have a wheel off the ground that's spinning very fast, it will actually try and send some of the power to the wheel with grip, which is what we want. It's kind of the best of both worlds. We have a clutch pack on the side of either axle gear. Now that is splined to the axle gear and the other half of the clutch pack is splined to the housing. As soon as one of these axle gears want to turn independent to the housing, so it's turning in the housing, i.e. we've got a wheel off the ground, one axle gear is stationary, the other one is speeding up inside this housing, that clutch pack will offer resistance to it. The harder we go, the more the spider gears will push on this axle gear, because of course them spider gears are walking against the axle gear and they're pushing it hard against the housing, it's turning in the housing and the clutch pack is preventing it. The more they prevent it, the more power can be sent back to the wheel with the most amount of traction. And hopefully that will get you out of whatever you're stuck in. So that's how the LSD works. They do wear out. You have to use special oil with an LSD because these clutch packs can be sensitive to the wrong oil, but they are the best of both worlds before you go to something like a locking differential. A lot of vehicles will now come out factory with a locking rear or even a front differential. And of course, a lot have a locking center differential for all wheel drive vehicles. The way in which they lock these differentials is to hold one axle gear to rotate at the same speed as the housing. We can do that pneumatically, vacuum, or electronically as well. We have a ring that will lock that axle gear to the housing and they must rotate at the same speed. We only need to lock one axle gear because by locking one and making it go the same speed as the housing, the other one must do the same as well. In order for a differential to work, there must be a differential in speed. So this gear would have to slow down for the other one to speed up and vice versa. We lock it to the housing, both gears have to rotate at housing speed. That's just how it works. And of course, there are people out there that like to weld them. If you wanna weld a differential center, you can weld the spider or pinion gears to the axle gears here. If we put a MIG weld in there, it becomes a MIG locker. Of course, that's a little bit rough, but it is a good way to lock your differential if you don't care about your car very much. Now, I mentioned center differentials earlier. If we have a constant all-wheel drive vehicle, it will have three differentials. We have one in the front, one in the rear, and we have a center differential to decide whether the power goes to the front wheels or to the back or a ratio of both. Now, normally when we put a constant all-wheel drive vehicle into low range or something like that, if it is also a four-wheel drive, that center differential will lock and we will get 50-50 split of the power going to the front and rear wheels like any other four-wheel drive. But, like I said, a constant all-wheel drive vehicle will have a center differential and effectively they can be a one-wheel drive vehicle if the power is going to the front left wheel or the rear right, we can have a one-wheel drive constant all-wheel drive and a ratio of the power going to each different wheel. Now, when it comes to rebuilding and repairing a differential like this, they are rebuildable. They should do a decent service life, but we can pull them apart and change 
the bearings. Of course, bearings are something we pull off, we change, and we replace as necessary. These ones are starting to gray a little bit and the oil wasn't in great condition. And that is a bit of a sign that a bearing is starting to fail. Of course, we inspect the gears as well. Any pitting in the root of the tooth or any heavy frosting or anything like that, we need to make sure we replace the gear set with the same ratio that came out, it's particularly in a four wheel drive, because if the front and rear diff ratios aren't the same, you can have a problem. As for the rebuild process, it does vary from differential to differential. This particular one, we have a crush spacer on the pinion. You can see this spacer here has been crushed under load and it's designed to do that. When we put this together, we have another cone bearing on the other side. We have two cups and we need to make sure there's enough preload on them bearings so we don't have loose bearings and that the pinion's wobbling about all the place and we don't want them too tight because they'll wear out and overheat. This crush spacer does that for us. When we tighten up the nut on the end of the yoke of this pinion, it will pull everything together and it will preload the bearings to a set amount of force. Now that force is the same amount of force it takes to deform this crush spacer. So of course we need to replace this when we rebuild and we will crush the spacer and that will set our preload forever until we pull it apart again. Some of these you can replace with a solid spacer and we can shim them. If we do it up too tight and we have too much rolling torque, which we'll check with a rolling torque wrench, we can go ahead and add extra shims in there to loosen everything up and make sure we have the correct amount of rolling torque, which will tell us how much preload we have on these bearings. But of course, this one has a crush spacer. It works perfectly fine. Just make sure you get a new one with the kit because the old one will not go again. Now, when it comes to rebuilding a diff, it varies a little bit from manufacturer to manufacturer, but it really comes down to three principles that we wanna to stick to. We want bearing preload on our two side bearings here. We wanna maintain good gear backlash, which we can measure with a dial indicator. And we also wanna maintain good tooth contact pattern. That varies a little bit, but usually we need to have the two sides of the pattern very evenly in the strongest part of the tooth, maybe a little bit lower on this one, and we wanna make sure they're close together. We don't want tooth contact pattern that is very sparse or very separated on the tooth on the concave and the convex side. That will create dramas later down the line because this will wear out very fast if we're not in the strongest part of the tooth. Now, of course, we fit the pinion to the housing. We fit that and preloaded that and we fit the center with the bevel gear on into the carrier or in this case, into the housing. We set our bearing preload with the two adjustment rings. So basically we tighten the two adjustment rings against each other until we get the rolling torque that's specified by the manufacturer for turning the bevel gear and pinion assembly. Once we've got our gear uh, rolling resistance correct, therefore our bearing preload is correct, we can advance and retract the two adjustment rings of an equal amount. So we maintain gear preload and bearing preload, and we can move the bevel gear left and right within the axle housing to get a good gear backlash. Usually 10 thou, 15 thou, depends on how big the differential is. Usually that's a little bit wider. And we wanna get good backlash. Once the backlash is determined, we can tighten down our caps and then check our tooth contact pattern. Now we use something called bearing blue or Prussian blue, and we coat three or four teeth on the bevel gear and we oscillate the pinion in the bevel gear until we can see a definitive pattern on the bevel gear and the pinion. We check the bevel gear and we make sure that the pattern isn't too far away from each other. We make sure that they're fairly central. There's a lot of different methods to check that and the owner's manual should also give you an indication of what is good tooth contact for a differential like this one here. And that's pretty much everything I know about differentials. If you're rebuilding one, make sure you try and use quality bearings. Don't forget to get your crush spacer if that's the way you're gonna go. And check your manufacturers. Some of them will recommend putting Loctite on these cap bolts. If a cap bolt comes loose, it can be quite catastrophic. And a lot of places are recommending using a high strength Loctite on them just so they don't come loose. Other than that, thank you very much for watching.